Susanna Hackman from Green Talk. I'm a sustainability consultant as well as the Green uh, Living Editor. And today we're here with a group of panelists with Georgia Pacific, and we're going to be speaking about the successes and failures of our school's curriculums um, with regards to natural conservation, nature, nature conservation. And I have with me uh, several panelists, and I'd like you to go one by one and introduce yourselves uh, to the audience. Go ahead, Jen, you start. Okay, hi. Um, my name is Jen Savage. Um, I am the blogger at thegreenparent.com, and I'm also the family blogger for Mother Nature Network. Um, I have a master's degree in environmental studies, and I was a park ranger with the National Park Service for 10 years before I became a mom, um, and then um, after my kids were born is when I kind of launched my writing, researching, and um, uh, career in uh looking into all things green for families. So um, that's what I do now, and I have two daughters that I, uh, you know, they're my uh, little guinea pigs and research base at home. So uh, I'm very glad to be part of this panel. I look forward to chatting with you all. Erin? Hi, my name is Erin Klein. I'm a teacher in Michigan. I teach second grade, but I've also taught uh, middle school, sixth and seventh grade, and first grade as well. I also blog at Kleinspiration.com. It's an educational technology blog, and I present around the country on many different various products, and I'm a heavy advocate for social media and education as well. Bobby? This is Bobby Madry. Um, I work here at Georgia Pacific. I'm the Wildlife Programs Manager. Um, I do a wide variety of things as far as um, endangered forest mapping, uh, endangered species, um, programs that we have here at GP, um, any kind of wildlife affairs or issues that come up. Um, I've worked at a variety of places over the years. I've got almost, well, a little over 30 years now in the wildlife field, been with the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Wildlife Resources Commission in North Carolina, uh, the National Wild Turkey Federation, and now with Georgia Pacific. Welcome, everybody. Um, let's get right into it. Um, what I wanted to start off with is talking about the successes of what you've actually seen and how the curriculum is being taught in the schools. So we'll go one by one. Um, Aaron, what have you seen, being as a teacher, what have you seen has been very successful in the way that uh, nature conservation is being taught in the school districts? Um, what I've seen be the most successful is whenever the children are involved in meaningful projects as opposed to something that's abstract that they don't necessarily understand. Um, one of the most powerful things that, that we did was we actually took um, our group of first graders, this was three years ago, to um, one of the local area parks, and we let them really just learn about nature in its, in its natural form. I mean, the kids were hiking. They were out all day. They got to see um, actual life cycles happening of butterflies in their exhibits, and it was just really amazing to see the kids' natural awe and wonder um, as opposed to just kind of staying within the walls of the classroom teaching them. I think that whenever they can kind of see it up close and personal, it, it, they're, they attach more meaning to it. So I think that anytime you can kind of bring learning outside of the walls of the classroom, um, kids have a natural attachment towards nature. So I think that that's very powerful. Jen, what's your thoughts about this? I couldn't agree more. And um, that was something that definitely came to my mind when I saw this question, that um, just in, I volunteer in my daughter's classroom for the last uh, five years, and you know I work with Girl Scouts and a lot of other programs. And the kids, it, it kind of goes without saying, they just learn so much better when it's outdoors, active, and it you know really kind of a more comprehensive look rather than just sort of reading about something. Um, last year, my daughter's uh, class, I think it was second grade, um, they spent a whole day on water quality. I think that's one of their standards of learning. Um, for this year, so it was something they kind of had to to check off, but they could have sat in a classroom and done experiments, and, you know, it might have been interesting. They could have read a little bit about pollution and water quality, and, and they might have gotten something out of it, but instead they went to a nearby um, preserve, and they looked at the bugs in the water, and they were, you know, they were able to identify, okay, these bugs are only going to be there if the water is very clean these bugs can live in dirtier water, and these bugs can survive in any water. So my daughter really took that with her 
And now any time she's around a creek or a river or a stream, she's poking around to see what kind of bugs are there. And I think it brought the whole lesson of water quality and pollution and what you can do to preserve the environment together by being out there and seeing bugs in the water. And, Bobby, what are your thoughts? Well, I I'll definitely agree with the other two. Um, I'm not a teacher by any stretch of the imagination, but I have the next best thing because my wife is a teacher. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> That counts. So I, I can't tell you how many times I've given uh, wildlife and conservation talks to uh, all different age classes of uh, kids, everything from kindergartners on up to high school, um, and definitely having something hands-on, um, just sitting there, you know, showing PowerPoints or slides, I mean, they go to sleep real fast, but if you can take them outside and really show them something, that makes a big difference. And having some hands-on things that they can touch and feel, I think, makes a big difference also. Um, one of the big things I've seen over time is there's a lot of misinformation that's in the classroom, um, especially when it gets down to uh, endangered species. Um, kids have no clue um, what is and what isn't endangered. I mean, it's just so much misinformation that I think that's the the main thing is to get them out in the field, show them what's out there, and uh, give them the right information. Bobby, let's expand upon that a little bit. When you say that they're given the wrong information, so how can that be rectified? I know when you say they can go into the field, but, but there seems to be more to this. Yeah, and I, and I don't know if I have an answer for that because um, there seems to be a lot of people out there that like to push their own agendas instead of, um, you know, going at it from a scientific standpoint and, you know, giving factual information. A lot of, you know, things, uh, depending on where people have grown up and what they've been exposed to, um, as they grew up, what their parents think, you know, you get a lot of um, people pushing things and ideas that aren't necessarily true. Um, I've had my kids, when they were growing up, they're in high school, well, one's in high school, one's in college now, but, you know, they come home and tell me stuff, you know, like white-tailed deer, you know, are endangered and, you know, I've never seen one and all this kind of stuff, and, and you know, it just makes my blood boil when that kind of stuff happens. <laughs> you know, nothing could be further from the truth. And, you know, and, and I don't know any way possible you can get around that because everybody's going to have their own opinions about things. But, you know, if we could get back to factual-based education as far as conservation and wildlife and um, sustainability go, it would go a long way in, in pushing everybody in the right direction down the road. But, you know, a good suggestion might be is, is, is um, getting in touch with a lot of the school districts and having reputable literature and reputable programs available for them. Um, that might help as well. So there's more like a structured curriculum, kind of like a textbook. That might help as well. Do you think, Bobby, that would help? Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure, you know, on educational materials what's the best thing other than, you know, I think it's important that, you know, the right information, of course, gets into their hands. Um, Aaron, any thoughts on that? Yeah, actually, um, I was just looking up a couple resources online. Um, I've got an 8-year-old daughter who anytime we work on any sort of project, she is totally engaged. I don't necessarily think that a structured curriculum or some sort of scripted program is what's needed here. I think it's more of kind of an out-of-the-box creative natural curriculum that needs to be very organic um, but yet be able to be implemented in schools quite easily. And what really came to mind for me, um, on, our, on our television, the Disney channels on a lot. And I, we often see the commercials for um, the project, the Friends for Change. And one of the big things, I mean, our whole house stops whenever these little commercials come on the Disney Channel. They're very, very empowering. And they're about children who are right around my daughter's age, probably a little bit older. But they're really making a change in their community for the good, whether it's, you know, nutrition and eating better, whether it's conservation and helping people. Um, but my daughter's always really inspired, especially whenever it comes to the information about environmental change. And she calls my husband and I out all the time, like, Mom, your, your phone's not being plugged in. Why don't you, you know, undo it from the wall? Or, Mom, why are you not getting the recyclable bags to take to the grocery store? So I think for kids it's really 
big for them whenever they learn something. There, there needs to be a call to action. Um, and I think that uh, if companies and if more businesses had ways to help and support the schools, not necessarily through you know, scripted programs and materials, but more of an approach like mobile labs to where they could go into the school and do an experiment with the kids or bring them out to, you know, the side parking lot and open up the doors to their mobile lab and show them what's inside. I remember a couple prior to me teaching when I was substituting, going, finishing up my graduate program, there were um, schools that I would sub in that would have these huge buses that would come to the schools and the children would get to go onto the bus and they had different um, experiments and stations set up on the bus that the kids would get to work with because, you know, let's face it, schools oftentimes don't have materials for funding to get all of these hands-on experiments in the classroom, but if companies were able to kind of help and support in that regard and you can hit more districts and more schools through these mobile lab type traveling, you know, exhibits, if you will, I think that that would be really powerful. Aaron, I just wanted to go back to Bobby's question, if you had a suggestion about how um, information is disseminated properly. Um, as far as to administrators, like getting in the school district? Or what no, edu or education, from an education perspective, so that information is actually taught properly, that, that the correct information is actually disseminated, because that seemed to be one of Bobby's concerns. So as a teacher, what do you think about that? Uh, well, I think, uh, I mean, if the teacher is the one delivering the information, there needs to be proper you know, training for the teacher, whether it's in services, professional development, having people come in and speak to the teachers um, to, to host workshops or whatnot. But um, I think, you know, ultimately it falls on the teacher if she's the one, he or she's the one giving the information to the kids. I, I would hope that all the information is definitely fact-based. Yeah, but I like your I like your mobile idea because that also can be expanded probably within service as well, so companies could come and give in service on particular, you know, um, items that they're doing, and so it gives the teachers more tools. How do you feel about doing that as well? Uh, me as a teacher? Yeah. I, I think it would be great um, if we had a day and afternoon, you know, once a month or twice, twice um, a month to where we had a mobile lab coming. I know companies like Orkin, um, they do our, our pesticides. Um, or pest control, and um, they have a mobile lab that goes and teaches kids about bugs and the different types of species of insects, and they go to schools as well. So I think, um, you know, as a teacher, I would love it to have that be one of my science lessons for the day, to just have the kids be able to, to work in a mobile lab, I think would be great. Let's go back to one really critical issue that we haven't really touched on yet, um, and I'm going to ask all the panelists this question. What do you think is the appropriate age that we should start teaching um, issues about nature conservation to? Is there, I know that every age learns differently, but where do you think we should begin? Erin, I'll start with you because you're the teacher. Um, I don't think that there is necessarily a specific age. I think that if, if children, just it's more of a, a lifestyle. I think if it's obviously taught in the home from zero to five before the children enter school, but you know, if, it, if it's not, then I definitely think in pre-kinder or kindergarten that these sorts of systems and learning needs to be put into place because, you know, in the classroom, in a kindergarten classroom, if the child is not exposed to um, nature and education type training at home, then their first experience will be in kindergarten. So if there were things like composting set up in the kindergarten classroom and if they had, um, you know, big Earth Day celebrations, that were just all a natural part of the school's um, environment, I think that it would be really easy for the children to not even realize that they were learning about conservation, but they would grow up and it would just be part of who they are as people. And I think that that's what it's about, you know, not putting the burden on these kids to feel like they need to be the change makers, but yet to just make it more of, of their lifestyle growing up. No, this is what we do. This is good for the environment. So this is kind of who we are as a generation. So. I would say start them as early as possible. Dan, what's your thoughts? <clears throat> Definitely agree with the early as possible. And, you know, if you could start this in the home kind of thing, that's the ideal. Um, I actually had two thoughts on this. Um, I think preschoolers and kindergartners, if that is a 
an awesome age to get involved in environmental education because there's such a sense of wonder. Everything is awesome to a kindergartner. And if you start with, like, composting pro uh, projects, like Erin was saying, um, recycling, you know, and then just the simple things kids can do, like turning off the lights and turning off the water when they brush the teeth, their teeth, that stuff just gets so absorbed. And kindergarten is such a good age for that because they're learning all these things and, and um like Aaron was saying, too, they'll call their parents on it, you know, hey, let's turn off the lights and things like that. And I think that's such a great to, great age to hook them on environmental interests. But um, I really think middle school, and I thought it was interesting that the um, curriculum that you guys work on is with fourth and fifth graders because that's, I think, a really another critical age where, um, okay, so kids now have a few years of school under their belt. They've got a little bit. They've got the reading down. They've got the basics of math. And and they're if they're still hooked on environmental interests and issues, they're starting to develop their own ideas. And they're really creative that, at that age about how to have a better recycling program at the school and <clears throat> how to save energy in the offices and how to make less waste in the classroom. And they're so excited. They're not kind of, not to say that high schoolers aren't involved and excited too, but I think they already are starting to get a little, you know, like kind of bored of these topics, whereas fourth and fifth graders, in, in just from what I'm seeing, they really seem still super excited about it, um, excited about doing what they can to protect the environment. And, you know, and they, they've now got some some knowledge base back that they, in their background, that they can, you know, come up with these great creative ideas to, to solve stuff. So I think, you know, early on, preschool and kindergarten, and then I think, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth grade are, are excellent ages to address conservation. Bobby, what do you think? Um, well, I'm going to come at this from two ways because, you know, I told you my wife was a teacher by training, but she actually runs a preschool. Um, she's the director of one. So, you know, having spent a lot of time around those, you know, little kids, you know, I, I agree with the fact that you got to start them as early as possible and, and turn them into, you know, conservationists from the get-go. Um, and they will. They'll come home and tell you, you know, you're not doing something right. Um, there's no doubt about that. Um and then as it progresses, you know, my wife was a middle school teacher. I should have brought my wife here. <laughs> um, she taught sixth and seventh grade, and, and she says the difference between sixth graders and seventh graders is like night and day because usually sixth graders are still eager to learn. They're, you know, they're still in awe of a lot of things, but then, you know, the hormones start kicking in, and by the time they're seventh graders, all they care about is, impressing you know opposite sex so um i think you have to get them before then um i'm sure you can get a few people you know into high school you can convert them over but you kind of have a weird age structure there that you uh, have to get around when you're in those formative years so you need to get them early and then you know kind of wait for them to uh, get through the stages they're in and then hit them again i think you know in high school when they you know are really um, having their adult thought patterns so uh, early as possible, in my opinion. Now, let's talk about what all of you think is the most critical factor to helping improve education about natural resources and conservation in the school districts. Erin, um, you go first. What do you think is the most critical factor to helping improve how it's being taught? I know you've talked about mobile. Do you have any other thoughts about other thoughts about this? Um, yeah, I think that letting kids' voices be heard is huge. Um, I think that these days kids, the information available is so varied. They can get on the Internet, and it's no more just that one-to-one -one connection with the child in the book or the child in the magazine or the child in the article. Um, but it's, you know, the child has infinite information at their immediate disposal. So I think that whenever you allow children to kind of take ownership of their own learning and explore what's out there, they instantly begin to start connecting these dots of how can, you know, that they know the problem, that's the obvious, the what they understand, but it's the, the how this happens um, where the teacher can really come in and, and help to scaffold to make a difference in their learning to make sure that, like Bobby was saying about those facts being given correctly. So if the teacher can help them, guide them through their, their internet searching, their project creation about how this is happening to the environment, 
then the children, I think, naturally start to kind of come together themselves and really become empowered on, well, what can we do to make a difference? Like, um, and they really want their voices to be heard. So I think by giving kids an outlet to kind of create projects and to collaborate together, even on a global level, it doesn't have to be kids within their own classroom. It can be kids within their school. They can do um, buddy projects, you know, kindergartners and fourth graders, or even connect, you know, the high schoolers with the middle school children, or even get local universities involved too. I think that making your community more um, cohesive and part of a, a real network is powerful. And um, I think that getting uh, organizations, whether it's the Gwanis Club or the Rotary Club, to come in and, you know, if they have volunteers that can come and help teachers within the classroom to do some of these projects and to help the students whenever they do have answers. Because I know whenever you take children outside of the building, you, you do need a little bit more um, guidance and supervision and even to carry the necessary materials to do the project. Um, extra adults on hand is always good. So really kind of reaching out to your community for help I think is, is good. There are organizations um, that do great things. There's one called ThinkQuest that allows children to really do intensive projects and collaborate with each other. And one of the winners, um, did one on conservation and education, and the project was just amazing. It was a group of 9 to 11-year-olds, and they created um, kind of like a, a web quest and a website all about biodiversity and the threats and how to take action, and then they included these 9 and 11-year-olds, different activities that teachers and students could use in the classroom, and they made it very interactive by including movies and different storybooks, graphics, and I think that by allowing children to do something like that to where they know that their voice is getting heard, but it's also a demonstration of their learning is, is pretty powerful because when they become the teacher, they really learn it. And then knowing that the purpose for learning is authentic because it's being shared with an audience is... Erin, can you repeat authentic. again that um, site that you used? Was it Stink Club? What was, was the name of the club? Stink Club. C-H-I-N-K-Q-U-E-S. Say that again, I'm sorry. Think Quest. Spell it for us. Um, T H I N K, like you're thinking something smart. Oh, Think, think Club. Okay, I just want to yep, make sure. Quest, I'm... like you're on a quest for learning. Q U E S T. Now let me let me expand just a, a little bit on some of the thoughts that you brought up about global learning. What technology do you love? I know you're very passionate about technology that would help further these goals. Uh, I think getting kids blogging is great because they can document their learning. Um, Kid Blogs is a great platform for that that's safe for children that teachers can set up easily and it's free. Um, and then I think once they're older, I know that some of the social networking platforms have to have children be a certain age, 13. Um, but I think getting children to connect with each other, whether it's on Twitter, on Facebook, or Edmodo, or just different platforms to where they can start to network with other children they really they understand in an authentic way the power of their voice. And I love your idea of, of budding. I think that's a great idea because it's it's bringing a new level of learning to the table because it's it's like you said once you become the teacher, the student becomes the teacher. It be, brings in a whole new world. Um, Jen, what's your thoughts about that whole what what uh, Aaron was saying? Oh, I love that idea too. Like you were just saying about <clears throat> letting kids become the teacher and. My thought on that is um, I think one thing that's missing from conservation education is is the, the element that makes it personal to kids. Um, they often are given worksheets or even do some experiments about um, science and nature and endangered species, but they don't ever focus on, um, you know, how this is affecting that the child and how it affects their family. And, you know, conservation doesn't always have to be how it affects you, but it is important to know, okay, so you're teaching kids not to, that you know, maybe you use less pesticides on their, their lawn or something like that, but why? And there are, you know, science experiments that they have where they show, you know, um, a molding of, of water. And so the kids can see from their lawn where it's, you know, the nearest, the closest um, water that it's going into, the closest waterway, you know, whether it's the the river or the 
the bay or the ocean near them, they can see how, you know, chemicals from their own home, not you know, pesticides in the yard or, or chemicals that are dumped down the drain in their homes are, you know, finding their way to that waterway. And I think when you when you talk about stuff like that and you kind of bring it back home to them, it makes it a little more comprehensive than just kind of um, learning that, you know, you shouldn't use chemicals in your house or you shouldn't, um, you know, create waste because it, you know, fills up the land cells too much or something like that. It, if you can if you can share with them a little bit more about their own environment, their own personal home environment and the, you know, nature that's near them, they, I think, have a better chance of understanding and caring about conservation. And, and Bobby, what are your thoughts? Um, my, my thoughts are similar to that. I think, you know, it's great to have classroom training on different things, but then you, you need to tie it into the real world. I think it'd be a great idea to go on a field trip to a trash dump. I mean, kids don't know where the mm-hmm. trash goes. They throw it in the container. Um, they don't know where their food comes from. They've never been on a, a lot of them have never been on a farm. They don't know that a hamburger comes from a cow. I mean, there's all kinds right. of uh, opportunities out there um, to tie what they're learning in the classroom into, you know, how is something made? You know, where does our gas come from? I mean, no. A lot of kids just don't understand that. They're just vague concepts, um, you know, and they're trying to understand how to conserve something, but they don't really have a good understanding of it. It sounds like there's uh, very much a resounding theme of experiential learning that's being um, talked about by all three of the panelists. Um, so I want to get to the next question. If we do provide experiential learning, what do you think is the challenges in teaching very complex conservation lessons to students? Erin, what do you think? Uh, I think um, if you ask any teacher, there's going to be a very common theme. Um, number one is going to be time, and number two mm-hmm. is going to be resources. So I think by by tackling those two, um, I don't think that the, the content or the, you know, no one is going to disagree with the importance of the topic, um, but I think finding a way to do these meaningful projects, um, like what Bobby was saying, go out of the classroom and visit even even the trash dump. We did that with our second graders this year. We took them to the Mel Center. We part of social studies. We study um, part of social studies. We study communities and families. So we really went to explore outside of the classroom the different communities and the jobs within our community and. The kids got to take um, parcels of mail and put them through the feeder for stamps, and they got to visit the auto mechanic shop and see um, some of the cars being lifted, and they were wondering how much gas it took to fill up the school bus, and they were really thinking, you know, about questions that affected them, and, well, if it if it takes that much gas to fill up a bus, like, and gas is this much a gallon, like, whoa, how much money is that? So, I mean, the kids were tying in math into it as well, and they were really curious. Um, and that, that's an experience that they're going to remember. So I agree with Bobby. But um, as a teacher, it's when do you have the time to kind of fit this into your schedule? And then even as much as teachers want to take kids outside of the building, a lot of times it's who's going to pay for the gas to get the kids on the bus to these places um, if they're not local. So I think that that presents a challenge. So that's why I think that having businesses partner with schools and bringing the resources to the schools, whether it's mobile labs or having specialists come in for like a job fair, um, that would be even really neat to get, you know, even a whole grade level or a whole school or separated kindergarten to second grade to have, um, you know, you see it on TV, but I don't hear a lot of it going on actually in real education, um, show and tell for parents when they come in. and tell what their job is and, and some of the information that they do at their jobs, kids are really interested in that. So I think that, again, just bringing the community into the school is important. And, again, like what Bobby said, just trying to make it as real as possible. Um, even how is something made, have the kids create something, even if you can't leave the classroom. Um, even if it's, unfortunately, something as small as just watching a short three-minute YouTube video but then trying to implement something hands-on in the classroom, even if you just take the kids outside to recess during a lesson to where they can explore the, the nature on their own campus could be powerful. Aaron, do you think there's any impediment with the administration with, um, with if businesses did come in to partner to allow this to happen? 
Do you think that they would be, you know, for this type of education? I think that that they would be. The only um, – some of the larger school districts, um, if there were competition for businesses in the area, I think that it might be, you know, the whole favoritism aspect or you're endorsing our school or – that, that might be an issue, but I, I think that if, if there was a partnership developed first between the school and the business, I think that it would be a much easier transition, especially if it was, you know, nothing was trying to be sold or advertised or marketed towards the school whatsoever, if it was all just 100% donation and in, in the true spirit of educating for the children. I think that those types of partnerships would definitely be allowed. Jen, what are your thoughts about all this? Um, again, agreeing with what Erin is saying, and also I'd like to add that um, I think one of the challenges, again, as, as well as time and money, um, one of the challenges that I'm seeing teachers face is they have, you know, they have so much to squeeze in. They have to teach to the test, and that's just where they're at right now. Um, these tests that, you know, all kids are taking at the end of the school year, the teachers have to get their kids to pass these tests. So they have preliminary tests at the beginning of the year, and then all throughout the year they have testing to see where the kids are at to make sure they're all going to pass at the end. So there's very little time left for anything extra. But I think a kind of a, a critical point here to make is that um, it, it's really helpful for teachers when you can show them how to make conservation a part of their overall curriculum. So they're not trying to squeeze it in. Um, they can make, you know, if you're going to have a word problem about math, rather than have a word problem that says, you know, if the train has five bottles of milk and loses three bottles, you know, whatever, and goes this fast and this distance, you could say, you know, if there are 200 and some peregrine falcons um, in this area and then we lose this many due to, you know, deforestation or we lose it or, you know, they've lost their habitat from pollution, then how many peregrine falcons do we have left? So it's still a word problem, but it's got kids thinking about falcons as well as doing some some subtraction. And I think, um, you know, teachers, like Erin was saying, they're pressed for time and resources. So if a, if a curriculum could be developed that shows them all the different ways that you can work conservation aspects into the points that they already have to teach to, the math, the science, the reading comprehension. I mean, if kids are going to be reading a several paragraphs and then have to answer questions about it, those several paragraphs can be about, um, you know, waste management or, you know, water quality or endangered species. That's a great way to have it in there. Um, it doesn't cost the teachers any extra time or money, and kids are still learning about conservation while they're also, you know, um, learning how to read critically, learning how to do their math, um, learning some science. So uh, I think helping teachers see how conservation can already be part of the standards of learning that they have to teach to would be very helpful to the teachers and help um, improve the you know, help improve education, conservation education in the school. Um, Bobby, what do you think? Um, I agree. I mean, I know that teachers are, you know, are having to teach, you know, towards those standardized tests and that kind of thing and no child left behind and every other thing that's being mandated these days. Um, one of my good uh, buddies is a high school teacher, and, and he just, you know, between doing that kind of stuff and, you know, behavior problems in class, he doesn't really hardly have time to teach. But, uh, you know, if the if the materials are available and they're easily um, gotten into the schools, you know, I think most teachers would be more than appreciative and be glad to, you know, to put that kind of thing into place. Um, you know, I think the matching it up to you know, the standardized stuff it would be the hard part. Mm -hmm. Let me go back to Erin on that question. Erin, you, you're on the hot seat because you're a teacher. Um, would you think it would be more valuable for in-service 
um, education of the teachers on how to incorporate conservation throughout their lesson plans, or do you think of a more structured curriculum or like ways of ideas that are like written or um, or audio or video? What do you think would be most helpful, or all of the above? Um, I think it depends, you know, on the the learning environment. It, it might vary to different um, demographics, different you know sets of schools, and what and what grade level. Um, one of the best, as far as resources and materials that I've seen work, happens to be a school um, or a company right here out of Michigan. It's in the Battle Creek area, and they developed um, a set of kits that are all science-based, and they're all centered and focused around inquiry-based learning and getting the kids um, working together collaboratively and then also um, doing hands-on projects. And just like Jen was saying about you know, if you're going to do a math problem, you might as well incorporate something that you're studying in social studies or in science into that. And I couldn't agree more. Um, I think teachers, especially these days, with all of the preparation for testing, et cetera, that we have to do, we're always looking for ways to do cross-curricular integration and get all the subjects in across all the disciplines that we have to cover and, you know, really making sure that our standards line up to make sense for the kids during certain parts of the year. So if there were resources available in kind of kits or packages that you could just, you know, pull off your shelf and really just kind of open up ready to go. I think that that would just be honestly a teacher's dream. Um, these Battle Creek Science lessons are these kits that this company has put together. Um, when I use them with my students, it's really nice because they include trade books for, you know, picture books that you could read aloud to the kids. And then it also included uh, a journal that included a writing element so that the kids could really process their thinking and, and document their findings through their scientific experiments or their observations. Um, we did a lot of um, activities outside. We built our own habitats. The kids had to go out on the playground and collect bugs and bring them back into the little aquarium. And these were all parts um, and materials that were included with these kits. So as a teacher, you know, meeting those standards like what Jen was talking about, we do have so much to cover. And just alone in, you know, first grade, I might be talking about weather one week and then the next week talk about animals and then the next week talk about um, a plant life cycle or something. So there's just many different things that you have to cover and sometimes they don't naturally link into each other. So I think that the more readily available kind of kits that can be hands-on, that include your literacy element and your math and everything all together and like a package would be really helpful for teachers. So it's kind of like thematic learning? Kind of, yeah. So you're just kind of weaving it in between the math, science, and English, it all kind of, literature, mm -hmm. it all kind of weaves in. Um, is there one topic that you think presents the most challenging challenges for lessons planning in, in regards to conservation? Erin, you go first. Um, that one's tough. I, I don't. Or a few. You know, if you stick a handful, a couple ones that you think, is there any any specific topics that you're finding that are really challenging to teach in the way of conservation? Uh, well, one issue that has come up, especially when I taught middle school, was uh, habitat loss in relation to global warming. And I think just because that's such a controversial issue, and there's so much, you know, quote, fact information, both pro and con, on the issue, I found that that was pretty challenging. And Jen, what do you think? I was going to say the same thing. I think climate change and global warming, as important as that is for kids to learn about, it's it's unfortunately still so controversial to even bring up um, because, you know, in my area, it's, it's still um, refuted. So... It's hard for teachers to kind of go there without launching into political debates that, you know, really take the whole lesson off topic. So, um, you know, I've noticed in my daughter's classrooms that they might try to bring it up, they might touch on it, but it's really, really minimal because they just don't want to go, they don't want to have these huge um, issues and problems with the uh, community. And I get that, I do. So they focus on, um, pollution and endangered species and water quality and things like that and, you know, barely address the issue of climate change, which is which is a pretty big one. So it's it's kind of sad that it's neglected. And Bobby, what do you think? 
Well, me not being a teacher, I'm kind of hard pressed to <laughs> have an opinion on that. I mean, climate change is definitely a, a tough subject to, to teach. Um, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't touch that with a ten foot pole. But um, <laughs> you know, I think it is important for kids to know because it is you know, a, a fact that the climate is changing, and it always has, and I think if you t- taught it in that context, then, you know, you'd be okay just trying to get away from the the subject of, you know, what is causing it or if it's just a natural cycle thing. I mean, it's, you know, that gets that's when you get into the political realm. So, um, you know, I'm not real sure about other topics. Um <laughs> So let's go back to uh, one of the other the other points. Um, it, I know it's a very broad question, but I will ask this: How might curriculums be adapted to better address conservation topics in each state? I know that you're all in different states, but are you hearing about how it's it's being addressed in different states differently, and how they're able to do it better, or they're having issues? What are you all thinking about about all that? I'll start with you, Aaron. Could you say that one more time? I'm sorry. Um, how might curriculums be adapted better in different states based on the topics that they have at hand? Are you seeing? Are you seeing? That, are you hearing as a teacher that other states are doing stuff very well and other states are not doing it as well? And and why is that? Is it you know? Is it based on um, parent involvement? Is it based on um, the curriculums that they have at hand? Um, is it maybe based on how it's being taught? What's your thought there? I know it's a very broad question. It is. I think um, I don't know if it's necessarily even a state-to-state differential factor. I think it could even be different districts. Um, I I live in Dundee, which is a suburb of well, not necessarily a suburb. We're about 45 minutes south of Detroit, but there are so many schools literally right down the road from us that are extremely different. Um, from the landscape that the children in our area encounter every day, um, the main one being class size and lack of resources. There are, are children, um, and it's it's hard for me to even imagine um, that are, are going to school in some of these many of these schools in the Detroit area that don't have backpacks that worry about you know breakfast, let alone what resources they're going to have available in the classroom. So I think that that's a huge factor, but. Um, in regards to curriculum, and I think right now there's a huge change with the Common Core standards that have been rolled out. Um, now, they're not new, but they're definitely being more enforced and implemented in across the dis- different districts across the country. Um, so I think that right now teachers are just trying to tackle the new standards that are, are being delivered to them and um, trying to figure out how to align everything to kind of wind it together in a cross-curricular way to make sure that your math can tie into your social studies and incorporate some of the arts as well. And if you're going to do something with comprehension, then can you tie in a social studies book or something? So I think um, it's just really important to keep – everything doesn't have to be so prepackaged either um, or, or scripted. I think that involving the students and allowing them to kind of help you create the lessons is powerful, um, you know, and avoiding things like word searches and, you know, that's that's not going to necessarily enhance your vocabulary as much as some of the other activities would. So anytime you can bring something that's project-based or inquiry-based into the classroom, it's going to be the biggest um, bang for your buck, if you will. Now, one thing that you talked about, I just wanted to touch upon it, is you said that they're changing the Common Core. What does that mean? Well, they're not they're not changing the Common Core. The Common Core is something um, that, on a national level, last time I checked, um, it, I think every state except for four, and it's probably fewer than that now, have adopted this, these new sets of standards. So it's more to, I hate to say, standardized education, but I guess make it more um, consistent from state to state. So every single kindergartner, no matter if you're from Michigan or California or Washington, will be learning the same standards um, at approximately probably the same time, but they'll they'll all be kind of digging deeper into the same same concepts. 
so that you're not going to have a discrepancy if you go from a different district or a different state as far as what um, standards are being taught. Whereas a couple of years ago in Michigan, we had grade level content expectations, and I had friends who taught, you know, 17 miles away from me who taught in Ohio, and their same grade level was teaching something entirely different than we were here in Michigan. And I was like, oh, yeah, our third graders study that, but our first graders are studying this right now. So it was kind of um, very different. So you can imagine if children moved or um, it was just a uh, kind of very inconsistent. So they're just normalizing what's being taught across every grade level across the country right now. So what you might have taught last year, you're not going to teach this coming year. So teachers are just kind of trying to get a handle on all this, these new standards that they're going to be required to meet. And Jen, what are your thoughts? <clears throat> I liked what Erin said about making a curriculum sort of comprehensive and inquiry-based. Um, my daughters really like to do the junior ranger program at the different national parks that we visit, and one in particular at Yellowstone that we did this summer, uh, they did the junior ranger program, but they had another, an additional program called Young Scientist, and I wasn't sure if they were going to be into it or not, because we were kind of eight days into our camping trip, and I thought, you know, they might be kind of done with all this, but they both were really excited about it, and it was, um, you know, you kind of started with a, a hypothesis you know, what do you think about this or what do you think about that? And then it gave you all these different ways, like, um, you know, experiments to do in the geysers and hikes to take and even a few math problems to solve. And, and there was, you know, definitely reading comprehension in there, you know, until you got to the end. And this was probably like a three- or four-page booklet. And then at the end, you know, you kind of answered your question, you know, well, were you were you right? Is it is it this or is it that? And, you know, can you see the different the different steps that you took to kind of solve this problem? And, and I just thought it was really cool because, like I said, it involved everything, math, science, reading. Um, and and it, it, it was started out with a question, um, you know, about a question that they had to answer. And, and they kind of took a guess at the beginning. And then after doing all this learning, they determined at the end if they were, you know, correct or not correct. But either way, they, they learned – so much throughout the way, and um, I think that's such a great comprehensive kind of overall way to get a conservation topic across. And Bobby, what do you think? I liked what she just said. Uh, one <laughs> of the, you know, one of the, my big pet peeves with uh, the kids of today, and I have two of them so I can talk about it, is <laughs> that we don't allow them to fail. Um, you know, I think it's great if they can go into a project and and then at the end they find out well you know if I'd have done it different then it would have been you know I would have had a, a better outcome but instead you know most of the ways you know you end up with a, a bad grade or you know your GPA goes down I mean the way everything points today is everybody's so scared of, of what their grade is going to be that you know we don't allow them to investigate other avenues because they're also focused on that, you know, getting to the end that they don't, you know, pick up what they could learn on the journey. Um, and, you know, what she was just talking about was, you know, that would be super if, you know, you could start out with, well, what would happen if you did this? And then you could pick which way you wanted to go with it. And maybe, you know, you end up being a failure at the end. But that's okay because you learned a lot on the way. Um, so you know, I think that kind of learning goes a long way towards getting a better education in some of the ways that are happening today. One of the last things I want to touch upon, because Aaron brought this up, and it is a, a very big concern to me as well, is when you have districts that are, you know, with kids who, like Aaron said, you know, their only meal may be lunchtime, they don't have backpacks, you know, it's hard to teach in the classroom. How do you all think that we could change and bring conservation in that these kids can get it and actually give them a better learning experience? I know that's kind of a very lofty question, but it, it's a concern that I'm having because we're talking about all these experiential and we're talking about thematic learning. Those districts, you know, are, are struggling. So, Erin, I'm going to turn to you because I, this is something that I know is very personal to me. How do you think that we can bring nature in um, to teach these kids and that they get it and it, it helps the teachers as well in, in their teaching style? Um, sometimes I think that, you know, you don't necessarily have to have – 
funding to do these inquiry-based or problem-based learning assignments. There is a great article um, that I just read by a lady named Lauren Davis, and she did a huge write-up on project-based learning assignments, and she gave really good examples of what she considered to be inauthentic learning and authentic learning experiences. And one specifically that she shared was, um, you know, an inauthentic experience could be just something as simple as creating a model of an ecosystem and then describing the life cycle and the food chain as it relates to it. And while this might seem like it's um, project-based and hands-on, um, a more authentic approach could be to have students, um, you know, think about a local building contractor who's planning to bulldoze trees in an area that's close by, and then to have children think of one type of um, indigenous tree to the area, and then design a presentation to try and convince the contractor to spare those trees based on the impact that it would have on local ecosystems. So to do a project like that, I don't think that you necessarily you know, need materials and funding. I mean, you just need access to a telephone or an email address, and teachers can get that for the students and kind of bring that in. But it's more or less just leaving open-endedness um, time into the classroom so that the children can think about the product, think about the content, and talk with each other to spark conversations and dialogue. I think that um, as teachers, it's hard for us to kind of let go and give control to the students so that they can actually turn that into creative thinking. So sometimes, you know, even though what would be best is if we all had more money in our schools, you don't necessarily need money and funding and products and materials. You just need um, ideas for creative lesson planning. So I think that that can go a long way as well. But Erin, um, one question I have for you is when you have um, teachers that, like, you know, they have all the regulations that they have to teach you, you know, no child left behind, all the testing, what do you suggest is a way to get teachers to start sparking their own passion again about these open-ended lessons that you're talking about? Do you think in-service community, uh, in-service planning might help with companies? What do you think would spark their passion again? I think, for the most part, teachers want to teach that way. I think that um, they are told that they have to cover the standards in a certain way to prepare for tests. Um, but I think that, I don't know, I don't want to blame administration and then blame, you know, higher up, and I don't like just passing blame. I think um, if teachers just kind of started doing it, um, and some people have that freedom to just close their door and teach the way that they know is best, and uh, some do not, unfortunately. But I think that, you know, through personal learning networks, even online, if more teachers just started to communicate with each other and say, you know, we're not going to teach this way. We are going to take a stand. We know what's right for children. We need to be more project-based. We need to be more inquiry-based. We need to be more student-centered, and we need to be more of the facilitator. I think that um, that would help a lot. A big movement that's kind of um, trendy but actually very powerful right now in education is the flipped classroom movement, and I think that a lot of teachers are really kind of using that to allow more create, creative time and discussion and projects in the classroom to where they're having the children, the flipped classroom is they do the homework um, at home, which is now the, the quote, lecture, or watching the video, and then when they come to school, the teacher doesn't have to stand up and present the lesson per se. They can actually do the hands-on application, which used to be the homework. So it's allowing for more time on teaching, which is, what's needed, so I think that that's a, a simple fix. Is there any technology or forums that are available that um, teachers could go on that spark, you know, all these open open project um, discussions? Do you have a, a recommendation? As far as to, to learn about it or to get yeah. resources? Both, both. Um, well, just on Twitter, um, there are different chats that happen weekly. Um, the flip class chat happens every Monday at 8 o'clock Eastern, which is a great chat to kind of learn resources of the model I was talking about where the children do the, they watch the teacher's lesson at home through a video, and then they come to class ready to do the experiment or the hands-on learning or even to just have a discussion about the novel that they read or something. Um, so I think that, you know, Twitter is definitely one resource. That's where I, I learn a tremendous amount from through 
staying connected through my network. And uh, I think that, you know, the George Lucas Foundation has a wonderful resource, Edutopia, and they always um, have information about project-based learning and ideas um, that educators can, can use. So I think just, you know, doing, doing your research on, on the Internet and finding out what's available is helpful. It's actually, I'm glad you brought up George Lucas because he actually just had, a couple years ago, he started a database for green learning as well. Jen, what is, what's your thoughts about this? Well, going back to what you were saying about, you know, kids who can't afford backpacks and, and food, um, this that is my area for sure. Um, we have fundraisers all summer long to try to raise money for school supplies for the kids that can't afford them. And um, the school district keeps the breakfast and lunches going throughout the summer because for a lot of kids, that's their only meals, those meals. And if they didn't have it through the schools, they wouldn't have it at all. And it's hard to comprehend, but it's also hard, you know, you, you got to realize that these kids aren't going to learn anything if they're worried about whether or not they're going to eat. Um, so, yeah, they're not going to learn math and reading, and they're also not going to learn or care about conservation if the greater need isn't addressed. So, you know, that's a, that's just huge, and, you know, I'm not sure it fits into the parameters of what we're discussing here, but, but it is a big issue that a lot of schools face. Um, you know, the overall ideal conservation learning situation is to get kids out of the classroom and into nature because if you can get them to bond with nature at a young age, they will continue to care. And that's one of the studies that the Park Service did um, years ago, and it's kind of one of the reasons why they've realized now that their um, age base is uh, is aging because so much work was put into getting people out into the parks a couple of generations ago, and it has faded off a little bit in favor of other projects, and they, the Park Service has realized that they have kind of forgotten to continue encouraging kids to come to the parks. And so now, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, it was, you know, 20 and 30-year-olds coming to the park. And then 20 years ago, it was 40-year-olds, and now it's 60-year-olds are the are the greatest um, number of folks coming to the parks. And they realize that, oops, we've got a problem because, you know, kids are not falling in love with parks like they used to, so they're not coming back. Um, you fall in love at a young age, and you continue to go back, and then um, and then you care. You care about conservation if it's affecting an area that you love. So. Um, yeah, the ideal is to get kids out there into that nature so that they can fall in love with it at a young age. But it doesn't, I mean, that, you know, like Aaron was saying, those things, those kind of field trips are expensive, and who's going to pay for, you know, even just getting a bunch of kids on a bus to go to their local park? But it doesn't have to, you don't have to have a lot of money to learn about nature. And I think even just exposing teachers to those kinds of resources, um, I wrote a post about the kind of Twitter chats that, um, that kids are using to find mentors in different topics, and um, like like you were just saying, Erin, and I think that's really cool that you could kind of just have a, a hashtag, and if you know the hashtag and if you know the time, you can join in on these conversations and learn so much. And and you know, screening YouTube videos, and and is it is it TeacherTube? Is that the website, Erin, that has um, you know kind of approved educational YouTube-ish videos? Is that, am I thinking of the right website? Yeah. And school too. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So you know, utilizing those, you you don't have a lot of, you don't have to have money to find great educational videos that you can show kids to show them what's going on in the environment. And like Anna, you know, we know our good friend Beth Terry. You know, she fell in love with her issue and became so passionate about getting plastic out of her life because of a photograph that she saw. And this, it, you know, if we could share those kinds of photographs and videos with kids, um, you could spark a passion without, you know, spending a dime. And Bobby, what's your thoughts? Well, I've almost forgotten what the question was, but uh, <laughs> you, know, um, you don't have to, you know, and I'm going to agree with some of the things some of the other people said, but you don't have to go <laughs> get on a bus and go somewhere to, to do these kind of things. You could do it in, in, the own, in your own school. I mean, how do they recycle in your school? You know, how is their mm -hmm. food coming in? What do they do with the leftover? I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. I mean, every school almost has a piece of woods on it of 
some size or another, or some trees on it. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do without actually having to go somewhere. But if you could just get them outside of the classroom and doing something where they can touch and feel and see something, you know, different, then I think you uh, made a big play with them. Um, you know, so I, I know when I was a little kid that, you know, that was my favorite thing was just getting out of the classroom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, me too. Um, <laughs> Uh, what I'd like to do is sum up some of the, the points that we made here um, today. It was a great conversation. Um, some of the things that in order for um, nature conservation to be mainstream is the panelists, you all said that starting young was imperative, very imperative. Experiential, I can never say this, experiential and thematic learning was very important as well as connecting in your community because there's a lot to be learned just in your community. Um, partnering with businesses. Um, for in-service and mobile learning, another great point, um, and using technology as your friend um, to buddy learn, to connect, and to teach. Was there any other point that you thought that really resounded with you? Um, Aaron, I'll start with you first, that I didn't touch upon. Um, well, I think that even um, teachers knowing that there are grants and available funding out there, um, I applied for, I, I didn't think that I would actually get it, but I, I thought I couldn't pass up the opportunity. I applied for a, a Target grant a couple years ago um, and wrote a proposal so that I could take the kids to our local science museum. And I, it was, um, it took me a couple of hours to put together. I had to get estimates for cost for transportation, for cost for tickets, how many kids would be able to go. I had to get permission slips. Um, you know, I had to actually draft up an original permission slip, and there was a lot of work that went into it, but in the end, I was awarded, you know, almost $1,000 from Target so that I could take um, our sixth graders on a field trip to the local science museum, and they still talk about that, and that was a couple of years ago, um, how much fun they had. And some of the kids in our school, some of the sixth graders, had never even been out of their own town, and this was the neighboring town that we went to visit. So even that experience of being out of their hometown was, was really neat. So I think that, um, you know, just tapping into resources that are available within the community is important as well for teachers. And Jen, what's your thoughts? Yeah, um, uh, those are all, all great points. Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing for me, the key thing is, as far as what's relevant to this discussion is helping teachers find ways to work the overall topic of conservation into the core curriculum that they already have to address. And Bobby, what's your final thoughts? I think you pretty much covered everything that came to mind with me. Um, I think it was a good conversation. Yes, me too. Yeah, I really enjoyed this conversation. I want to thank all of you for participating. Um, I, I, I love the ideas that came out of it. And I'm going to turn it back over to Georgia Pacific. Thank you very much. That was fascinating to me. Um, you all gave some great insights that I can take away um, in what I do, and I think the rest of the GP team here. Um, and we really look forward to continuing these conversations with you and a couple other people, um, and we'll follow up with the opportunity to have the next call um, in the not-too-distant future. Follow up with the opportunity to have the next call um, in the not-too-distant future up with the opportunity to have the next call.